coming up next on the Passion Struck Podcast. That's exactly what great catalysts do. They don't push harder. They identify those roadblocks and they mitigate them, right? They figure out, well, why is that person unwilling to change? Or how can I, rather than feel like pushing, help people see that they can actually choose the outcome that they want? And regardless of what you're doing, regardless if you're a big organization, a small one, a for-profit, a nonprofit, these barriers come up again and again. And I think the more we understand them, the more we can be effective at changing minds and driving action. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become passion struck. I am absolutely honored and thrilled to have Dr. Jonah Berger, one of my favorite authors on the podcast today. So much for having me. Great to be here. Jonah, I'd love to open these episodes out by asking a question that allows the listeners to get to know the guest. And we all have moments that define who we become. What are some that led you to become this expert on change, consumer behavior, marketing overall, and influence? It's a great question. Uh, it's hard to sort of pick out a couple key moments, but maybe I'll pick out one or two. I think one was I was in college and my grandmothers often do sent me a newspaper clipping saying, hey, maybe today it's an email rather than a newspaper clipping, but at the time it was a newspaper clipping saying, hey, there's a book out there. I think you might find it interesting. And I was like, okay, grandma, thanks. And the book was actually a book called The Tipping Point, which was Malcolm Gladwell's first book. And many of your listeners are probably familiar with his work. But that book changed my life in a few ways. First, it highlighted to me that one could bring together different disciplines in an interesting way. So that book is all about things catching on and the notion that things become popular and go from sort of unpopular to popular very quickly. And why? And so it was a little bit of social psychology. It was a little bit of sociology. It was a little bit of marketing. And I read it in college. And I was like, this is what I want to study. So I put together an individually designed major that mixed sociology and psychology and marketing together to begin to study why things catch on. And at the time, a new professor had come to Stanford, and his name was Chip Heath, uh, who may also be familiar to some of your listeners as part of the Heath brothers, who's written books like Made to Stick and Decisive and so on. And so started working with Chip around why certain rumors or urban legends get diffused. And the rest is kind of history. I really had always been interested in behavioral science and had been doing psychology research but I've been waiting to find that thing that I really found interesting. And this question of why things catch on, why things become popular, how we as individuals can influence others both to change their minds and drive action is a question I find fascinating to this day. Well, for the listener who might not be familiar with you and who isn't watching this video, I would just highly encourage that they read all your books. I'm such a huge fan. Invisible Influence was great. Contagious is one of my favorite books of all time. And today we're going to be discussing the catalyst, how do you change anyone's mind, which I think for our audience is something everyone would love to know how to do. Most of us try to push people harder, whether at home or in our jobs, to get people to change. And what I've seen throughout my career is that approach typically backfires. If this doesn't work, how do you get people to overcome inertia to change their minds? Yeah, I think it's even worth taking a step back of why I wrote this book in the first place. As you noted, I have written a couple books before, and I'd been doing sort of speaking and consulting around contagious and around invisible influence. And I was using some tools with clients that I found interesting and useful. And I started realizing that not all those tools were in the books that I had written so far. And I started knowing some commonalities between different things. And I wondered, similarly to you, could there be a better way to create change? Think about it. Everyone at the core has something they want to change. Employees want to change their boss's mind. The marketers or salespeople want to change the consumer's mind. Leaders may want to transform organizations. Nonprofits and the folks that work in them want to change the world. Startups want to change industries. Everyone. Some people say, I just want to change my spouse's mind. I just want to change my kid's behavior. Everyone at the core has something they want to change. But as you've noted, it often doesn't work. Right? Often we push, we pressure, we cajole, 
and nothing happens. And so the question I started to ask myself is, could there be a better way? Could there be a way to change minds and drive action, not by pushing, but by doing something else? And I found there's very much an, an interesting analogy to be made in chemistry. So in chemistry, obviously, change is really hard. Think about a diamond being squeezed together out of carbon over eons of time. Think about plant matter being turned into oil over millions and millions of years. Chemists obviously can't wait that long. So in the lab, they often add temperature and pressure. They heat things up, they squeeze them together. And you can make an analogy to the social world, right? When we create change, we similarly put energy into the system, right? We think if we just push people a little harder, they'll change. And it's clear why we think that. Uh, if there's a chair, for example, in the middle of a room and we want to get it to move, well, pushing is a great way to, to move that chair. And so we apply the same intuition to people. We think if I give more facts, more figures, more reasons, more information, they'll change. But if we think about it, the last time we tried to change someone's mind or someone tried to change us, we're different than chairs. Right? Force in a particular direction doesn't make us move, it often makes us resist. And so what does create that change? And so going back to chemistry, in the lab, chemists often add a special set of substances to make change happen faster and easier. These substances don't heat things up, they don't increase the pressure, they allow change to happen with less energy, not more. And these substances, as you can probably guess already, are called catalysts. And then what's most interesting about these is the way they create change. They don't squeeze things together. They don't heat them up. They don't add more energy to the system. They mitigate and remove the barriers to change. They identify ways to make change happen with less energy, not more. And I think the same analogy can be made to the social world. If you look at those great change agents, those catalysts in whatever organization or business you may work for or know of, they often they don't just say, well, what could I do to get someone to change? Instead, they take a subtly but importantly different approach. They say, well, why hasn't that person changed already? What's stopping them? What are the barriers or obstacles that are getting in the way? And how by removing those barriers, can I make change more likely? And it's a subtle shift, but a really important one. Often as change agents, we know a lot about the outcome we want to achieve, the thing we want to happen. We often know a lot less about the people, organizations that we're trying to change. But the more we understand them, the more we understand the barriers that are preventing them from changing, the more effective we can be. Yeah, and I think a great example of this that the audience could probably relate to is this image of a hostage negotiator. And can you just describe it in those terms? Because I think it vividly represents some of the key concepts. Yeah. Um, I, in writing this book, I talked to an amazing set of change agents. So I talked to the usual top selling salespeople and transformational leaders and startup founders that grew their businesses. But as you noted, I also talked to some more unusual folks. I talked to hostage negotiators. I talked to substance abuse counselors. I talked to parenting experts, which depending on whether you have a two or three-year-old at home, you probably think is the most difficult thing to change out there. Um, and I learned a lot from these individuals, and I also noticed a lot of common patterns. And that's actually what built the framework that's in the book, because I noticed the same things were coming up again and again across different areas, right? Whether you talk to that top-selling salespeople, or you talk to those hostage negotiators, they weren't saying exactly the same thing. But if you looked underneath, very much the same principles were going on. And talking to hostage negotiators, I found something quite fascinating. They said most people, when they become a hostage negotiator, those novices, those first-time negotiators, they want to jump to persuasion right away. And they want to say, come out with your hands up, do X, Y, Z, or else this is going to happen. And they have this notion, again, that if they just tell people what they want, that thing will happen, right? They want to move as quickly as possible to the outcome. And I think that's true of most of us as change agents, right? If we're a boss and we want to get our employees to do something, we think if we just tell them what to do, that'll work. If we're a salesperson, we just think if we say this is a great product or a great service, people will get on board. But the challenge is if we don't understand them, it's going to be really difficult to make change happen. And so what they find is those negotiators who've been around for a little while, those negotiators who are more seasoned, they don't start with influence. They start with understanding. They start with the person group of people they're trying to change. They start by understanding them and why they're there in the first place, and then use that to help them figure out a way to show those individuals that the best way to get what they want is actually to do what the hash negotiator wanted in the first place, right? The best way to get someone to come out with their hands up isn't say, come out with your hands up. It's figure out, well, why is this person robbing a bank, holding hostage, do whatever in the first place? Figure out what that is and you can help them see that what you want them to do is a really good way to reach your outcome. Because the challenge is the more we push people, the more they push back and the less interested they are in listening to us. And so really to create that change, to get them to change, we have to start with them. 
Well, I think it's such an important point. I have a 24 year old son who right now is doing his GMATs to go back to business school. And we constantly have this conversation of, he feels there's so much change going on now, especially in this digital world, where should he focus in the future? And I've talked to him a lot about emotional intelligence, having an adaptability quotient. He's in marketing, so he does a lot of digital media for big brands right now. But I think you bring up something that's going to be so core, especially to these younger generations, which is all these jobs are going to change, but one thing fundamentally isn't, and that is our interaction with people and knowing the science of how you can change minds, how you can influence people is going to be so vital, whether you're his age or my age or even older. So I think this is a huge area that people need to pay attention to. How you change is a topic that we've had a number of your peers come on the podcast to discuss. People you will know, like Katie Milkman, Eilat Fishback, Max Bazerman, I have Scott Galloway on the show tomorrow, Ethan Cross. But having read all their books, The Catalyst takes a completely different approach to removing the barriers to change. How is that? Yeah. Again, if, if you look at whether it's that hostage negotiator, that uh, transformational leader, the folks that are really good at change, again and again, you see the same five barriers come up. And so in the catalyst, I put them in a framework called the REDUCE framework. And that's an acronym that stands for reactance, endowment, distance, uncertainty, and corroborating evidence. And I'm cheating a little bit there. The corroborating evidence is two words, but I'm using them as one principle. It's a CE in REDUCE. But that's exactly what great catalysts do. They don't push harder. They identify those roadblocks and they mitigate them, right? They figure out, well, why is that person unwilling to change? Or how can I, rather than feel like pushing, help people see that they can actually choose the outcome that they want using guided choice, for example, rather than pushing. And so happy to dive into a few of the principles in the reduced framework. But again and again, regardless of what you're doing, regardless if you're a big organization, a small one, a for-profit, a nonprofit, these barriers come up again and again. And I think the more we understand them, the more we can be effective at changing minds and driving action. Yeah. And in addition to that framework, you talk about this concept of parking brakes. And to give the listeners some context, what is a parking brake and why are they important? Yeah. I think, I think a good analogy to think about a different lens on change is imagine you're parked in your car. So maybe you've come out of a kid's soccer game or the movies or whatever it might be, and you're parked on a hill, right? And so you get in your car, you stick your key in the ignition and you step your foot on the gas. If the car doesn't go, what do we usually think? We think well, we need more gas, right? I need, just need to step on the gas to get the car going up that hill. The same thing is true of change, right? If we make our initial pitch, our, our initial, whether it's a sales pitch, a phone call, an email, and it doesn't work, we think, well, let me just push a little harder. Let me step on the gas. Let me add more energy to the system. But if we're going back to that car, if the parking brake is pulled up, we can step on the gas all we want. The car's not going to go anywhere because the parking brake is, is in the way. And so a much more efficient, better, more effective way to create change is not by pushing, but by identifying those parking brakes and mitigating them, right? Figuring out, well, well, why is that person not yet ready to buy this service? Why are my employees not interested in what I'm suggesting? How can I get the rest of these people to see something differently? Focusing less on me and what I want and more the breaks for those individuals and the barriers that are getting in the way. And if we can do that, change is a lot more likely. Yes, well, that's not the only topic that you talk about that comes out of behavioral science. Another one is the endowment effect. And in that people tend to overvalue what they already have. Why does that tend to happen to us all the time? Yeah, what we have to begin with is easier for us. In every story, there's a hero and a villain. I like to think of in these change journeys that we are the hero, right? You are a parent trying to change your kid's behavior. You are a boss trying to change an organization. You're a nonprofit trying to change society's approach to something. You're, you're that hero. You've got your your goal at the end, but there's a villain. And the villain in this journey is called the status quo bias. And this may be something that some of your listeners are familiar with, but basically anytime we're asking people to do something, we're asking to give up something old and switch to something new, right? Anytime someone's making a choice, whether it's a choice of a product or service, where you might be using a certain product or service and you're being asked to switch to a new one, um, it might be an idea. There's an old idea and people ask you to think about a new idea, an old program or initiative and switching to a new one. And anytime there's choice between an old thing and a new thing, people have a tendency to stick with the old one. And this is what's called the status quo bias. And if it was just a tendency, it wouldn't be a bias. The reason it's a bias is that even when the new thing is better, 
by some estimates, even when the new thing is 2.6 times better, people still tend to stick with the old one. And that's why it's a bias, right? Even when the new thing is better, people stick with the old one. And there are kind of key reasons that underlie this status quo bias. And this is what gets us to the endowment effect, right? The first is ease. It's just easier to stick with things that we've done before. I've never gone grocery shopping with you before, but I bet whenever you're in the grocery store, you tend to buy the same things, right? Not exactly the same things every week, but if you buy eggs, you probably buy a certain size, certain number of eggs from a certain brand. You buy milk, you buy a certain size milk from a certain brand because it's just easier, right? It requires less work. You don't have to figure out whether another one is good or not, or whether the size is too big or too small. You know it's going to fit your needs. And so that's one reason behind the status quo bias. The second, though, that gets into the endowment effect is that old things, products, services, ideas aren't just old products, service ideas. They're someone's product, service, or idea, right? I may have a relationship with somebody who works at a particular organization. A particular idea or initiative or program isn't just some idea, initiative, or program. It's someone's idea, initiative, or program, and they're probably unwilling to let it go. There's some great research on home selling. Finds that the longer that someone's lived in a home, the more they value that home above and beyond market price. And so sure, homes go up over time, but even controlling for that, people value it more. Why? Because if you've lived there, it becomes your home. It's not just a home, it's your home. And you can't imagine letting it go. Same thing in startup valuation, right? Often founders have a lot more valuation for their business than maybe some other people do because it's their business. They can't imagine letting it go. And then the last bit is just that old things feel safe and new ones feel risky, right? Old things aren't perfect, but at least we know why they're not perfect. We know what the problems are and the benefits. New things are risky. Sure, it might be better, but it might also be worse. And is it worth taking the risk? Huh. If people aren't sure, they stick with what they're doing already. And so those are the three kind of pieces behind that status quo bias that cause people not to do things and not to move forward. And so we have to ease endowment as change agents. We have to encourage people to let go of the past. And in the book, I talk about a number of strategies to help them do that. Yeah, and this is a great lead into this past week. I interviewed another author who you may know, Dr. Benjamin Hardy, who wrote a book with Dan Sullivan called The Gap and the Gain. And I love this book because in it, they describe how we tend to measure ourselves against what we see others achieving instead of the gains that we make in our own lives. And this kind of goes into what you're talking here because we see our present self we have this image of what the future self could look like, but I think the status quo impact has an overall negative consequence to our ability to change, and that's why people get so stuck, or why, as you put it, why good is the enemy of great when it comes to making change. There's a great book by Jim Collins that some of your listeners are probably familiar with, Good to Great. And he has a very nice quote in there that says, why don't we have great schools because we have good schools? Why don't we have great this because we have pretty good this? And you can make the same analogy to change more broadly, right? If you have a couple of flies in your house, you don't call an exterminator. You just hope the problem goes away. But if your house is infested with cockroaches, it's terrible. And you call the exterminator right away. And so this is a little bit the challenge of change, right? If something was terrible, people would have changed already. The challenge is when something is okay, but not great, they're sitting there going, well, is it worth all the cost? We may get into uncertainty in a couple of minutes, but all the switching costs to do something new when the thing I'm doing already is pretty good. There's a great old study that looks at the context of injuries. And they ask people, which do you think hurts more, a major injury or a minor one? A major injury being like a, a heart attack or a shattered kneecap or really big major injury. And a minor injury being you twist an ankle or you have a lower back pain that won't go away or sort of once in a while when it rains, your shoulder hurts. And then everyone says, well, of course, major injuries hurt a lot more. And that intuition makes a lot of sense, but it's actually wrong. And the reason is that, yes, when they happen, major injuries hurt a lot more than minor ones do. But when you have a major injury, you get it fixed. Right? You go to the doctor, you go to rehab, you go to physical therapy, you get the bones set, you do all the work to fix the problem. When you have a minor injury, you often say, well, it's just fine. It's not over the hump to make me go out and, and create that change. And so you never get it fixed. And so over time, that minor injury actually ends up causing a lot more pain than a major one. And so one thing you need to do is, as I talk about in the book, is a strategy I call highlighting the cost of inaction. Right? Inaction always feels safe. It always feels easy, but it often isn't as safe as we might think. I tell the story 
I have a cousin who's, who every time he wrote his email would write in his sort of name at the bottom, his signature. So he'd say best Charles at the end of his email. And I was sitting there going, why do you write this every time you write an email? You should just automate this as part of your email signature. She said, I don't know really how to create an email signature. It doesn't take me that long to write it each time. It only takes a couple seconds. At each moment, it would always take longer to figure out how to do it than to just do the old way. And so at each moment in time, it's easier to stick with the old way. And this is a challenge, obviously, many of us are facing with others. And so I thought about it for a while and I was writing this book. And so I ended up coming up with a strategy that worked. I asked him, well, how long does it take you to write your little email signatures? I don't know, five seconds. And I said, how many emails do you write a week? And he said, I don't know, 200, 300. And I said, okay, how much time do you spend every week writing your email signature? And he thought about it for a minute. Then he did some calculations. Then he typed into Google how to automate an email signature. Because at each moment in time, it's cheaper to stick with the status quo than it is to change. Almost always it is. Because there's always an upfront cost to that change and we're wary of the upfront costs. And so inaction is often cheaper than action at each moment. But over time, just like that minor injury or just like that case with the email, over time, the minor injuries, the small things end up costing us a lot more. And so we have to get people over the hump. We have to highlight that cost of inaction and show them that actually it's going to take you a lot more time if you don't take the effort and make the switch. Now. Yeah, I think a perfect example of this as well is when I was talking to Katie Milkman, um, she said that one of the things that got her into the career that she's in as a behavioral scientist is seeing a statistic that 40% of premature deaths are the cause of people's inaction or the lack of taking choices to do the healthy things that would allow you to extend your life. So I think that's another great example of what you just brought up. Yeah, um, inaction is certainly easier and easy is very attractive often. And so we have to help people see that while in the short term inaction feels easier and the long term action is often the better thing to do. Well, I'm going to jump to a different story that you have in the book. And this one was fascinating to me because I studied the 15th century explorer Hernan Cortez when I was at the Naval Academy. And he did something extremely unorthodox that I and probably most people would see as extreme and selfish. Could you explain what that is and the motivation that led him there? Yeah. And I want to be careful. I'm going to tell this story. And then at the end of it, I'm going to make it clear that I don't think most of us want to do this most of the time, but I think a version of this can be really clever. Um, and so the story is basically, he's traveling to the or parts of the Central America. He's got a crew with them. They land somewhere. He wants to encourage them to go inland to find gold. And many of them are like, I want to go home. We got here. We did your thing. We haven't found what you said we were going to find. We want to go home. And so he's facing this sort of mutiny. No one wants to end up continuing the expedition inland. They all want to go home. And if they go home, he's in trouble. So what does he do? Well, he can't just tell them that they have to stay because they don't have to listen to him. And so what can he do to get them to stay? And so what he does is, as you said, unorthodox, he ends up burning the ships. What do I mean by that? Well, he literally sets fire to the boats. Uh, and now there's no way to go home. And he says, well, look, guys, there's no way to go home. We don't have boats. So we got to figure out some long-term strategy to stay here. And now we don't really have any choice except explore and go inland and see if we can make a go of it. And so essentially what he did is he took the status quo off the table. Right? He said, the thing you're doing before is no longer an option because the boats aren't there anymore. Now, I agree that seems dr draconian and crazy, and we don't often want to do that. But there are versions of this that happen on a daily basis. So as I'm writing the book and working on the thinking about whether burning the ships is a good strategy, I get this email from my IT folks at Wharton basically saying, hey, Jonah, your desktop is so old that we're no longer supported anymore. You can get a new desktop. We're happy to encourage you to get a new desktop and you can buy one with your funds or whatever it is, but we're not going to support the old. And they're not completely burning the ships, right? They're not literally coming to my house and throwing, throwing my desktop out the window. But they're basically saying, we're not going to subsidize the status quo anymore. It's costly. It's costly both to you and us. And we're not going to subsidize it anymore. You don't have to change, but we're not going to make it easier for you to do nothing than we have to. And so I like this version of sort of thinking about, well, what is the status quo option? How can we take that off the table? And by taking it off the table, or at least not subsidizing it if it's not worth it, make people more likely to change, right? Not by telling them they have to, but saying, well, I'm not going to help you I'm not going to make it easier for you to do the thing that's not as good for you. I'm going to encourage you to do something new because I think that's the best course of action. Okay. And then later on, you introduce two other 
concepts. One of those is the zone of acceptance, and the other one is the region of rejection. And how do both of those impact people's perceptions? Yeah, so I think there it's worth taking a little bit of a step back. So we talked a little about reactance and the idea when pushed, people push back. And the fact that people, when they feel like other people are telling them what to do, they stop listening. And so there's a bunch of strategies in the book there around allowing for agency, giving people back some sense of freedom and control, whether it's through choices, whether through asking questions or, or other means. Um, the E is endowment. And so we talked a little bit about urging people to realize that doing nothing isn't costless, but we've gotten to D, the D, which is distance. And the basic idea here is when we ask people for too much, they ignore us. They stop even listening to the possibility of changing. And so a nice way to think about this is take political beliefs, at least in the United States, right? There are some people that are on the far right, and there are some people on the far left. And you can imagine that almost like a football field, right? So the far right would be one end zone, the far left would be another end zone. And most people, I don't know exactly where you are as a listener, but you're probably arrayed somewhere on that field, right? If you're very conservative, you'd be on the zero yard line or the one yard line of one end, very liberal, one yard line of the other. If you're exactly in the middle, you'd be on the 50 yard line, but most of us might be on the 30, the 40, the 45 yard line of one side or the other. And the challenge is when we come in and we ask people to change, but on politics or anything else, we often ask for too much. We often ask for something that's so far outside of where they are at the moment that they're unwilling to listen. And so there's a zone right around people's current beliefs, current attitudes, called the zone of acceptance, right? Move five yards one direction, five yards another. It's close enough. It's not exactly where I am, but I'm willing to listen. But if it's 15, 20, 30 yards in one direction, even if it's in the direction that I like, I'm probably not going to listen to you because it's too far away. It's that region of rejection. And so what we have to do in some sense, we have to ask for less and ask for more. Rather than trying to move people right away so far on the field, we have to move them a little bit and then move them a little bit again. I was talking to a doctor that was trying to get an obese trucker to lose weight. And so it was this guy, he was in his truck all day, was drinking basically three liters of Mountain Dew a day, which has oh. a huge amount of sugar. It has, I don't remember how many, but a large number of Snickers bars worth of sugar. And it was just convenient and easy. And he comes in and he says, look, whatever. And she says, you need to lose weight. And But here's the challenge. If she says, stop drinking Mountain Dew, he's going to say, thank you for your advice, doctor. And then she's probably never going to see him again. That's so far from where he is now that he's not going to listen to that suggestion. And so instead she did something really clever. She says, look, I know you love Mountain Dew and I know you like drinking. I'm not going to tell you to stop, but try to go from three liters to two. It's going to make you much healthier. And he grumbles and he doesn't want to do it. And she says, look, you can fill up one of your old bottles with water. That'll make it easy in the cab of your truck. Grumbles doesn't want to do it, but he comes back a few months later and he's been able to do it. He's been able to go from three to two, but she doesn't stop there. She says, fantastic, really good job. Now try to go to one. Again, he grumbles, he doesn't want to do it, but he eventually moves from two to one. And then she says, fantastic. And now that you move from to one, from two to one, see if you can go down to zero. And the guy still drinks Mountain Dew once in a while. She hasn't quit cold turkey, but he lost over 30 pounds, right? Because she didn't tell him, don't do it. That's a great way to get him to stop listening to whatever she has to say. Instead, she moves him a little bit and then a little bit. She asks for less and then she asks for more. She doesn't stop with the less. She asks for less and asks, and then asks for more. And it's almost a little bit like what engineers or product designers called stepping stones. So think of if you've got a big river that you're trying to get users to cross, you've got one version of a product or service and you want to move them to a completely new one. If you ask them to move right away, they'll say, oh, it's too far away from what I'm doing. I can't do it. But if you move them one step and then move them another step and then move them another step, eventually you get them across. And so by breaking big change down into smaller chunks, it makes it easier to move and more likely that people eventually get where we want them to go. Yeah, just to follow on, since you started talking about politics, do you have any thoughts on, as we observe this most recent midterm election, which I think for many people turned out far different than many expected, how did the Democrats in this case find that movable middle and were able to bring more people over? because I think it's a good example of this concept. Yeah, and so the movable middle is certainly related, right? So take again that football field, right? Wherever we are, there are some people that are on our side, there are some other people that are far away, and then there's a chunk of folks that are in between. Um, and particularly in politics, you know, people talk about, look, if we're trying to change the folks that are very far away, that's possible, but that's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort. And there are strategies to do that, and I talk about some in the book, but. An easier approach is to go after the folks that are already open 
to changing, right? This sort of movable middle, the set of individuals that maybe aren't always aligned with us, but on this particular issue or on this particular idea, they're more likely to see things along, along our line. And so because they're open to change, because they're closer to where we're asking them to go, right? We're not starting with people that are 40 yards away. We're starting people that are five or 10 yards away. And so it's easier to move them. And so at least whether you're a politician or a political campaign or a startup trying to find those new customers, starting with the movable middle, starting with individuals that are open to change or close enough to the position you're asking them to get to is often a more effective way than trying to get that big change right away. Yeah. And I think a related topic to this is deep canvassing. And I was recently talking with Professor Dolly Chug about her new book, A More Just Future. And she talks in it about the science of good people and how our prejudices and biases get in the way of the way that we see the world. And I remember as I was growing up, there was a huge bias to the LGBTQ phenomenon in general and getting people to even consider putting that on ballots to change the laws. There was a point in time I never thought it would happen, but through deep canvassing, they were able to do it. I think it was the most rapid change in political orientation that we've ever seen. I don't know if you can talk about that example, but why is deep canvassing work so well to help people overcome longstanding prejudices? Yeah. So sticking with that football field analogy, one thing I talk about in this area of the book is the idea of switching the field. If you think about that football field, if you're in one place and someone you're trying to change is far away, you're asking them to move a large distance, it's not necessarily going to work. But what's interesting is if you see things from a different angle, well, you guys are on the same part of the field, a different field. Think about to take that, imagine a horizontal axis and a vertical axis. Well, yeah, you may be on the negative 30 yard line and then on the positive 30 yard line, so you're 60 yards apart, but you're both at the same point on that Y axis if, if you look uh, on a different dimension. And so what deep canvassing is really about is the same idea. It's rather than saying, well, let's start with a place of disagreement or 60 yards apart on that field. Let's start on a place of agreement. Let's find an area where we see eye to eye and use that to build around to something else. And so it's a great approach that's been used both in academia, in academic research, as, as well as in, in practice. But essentially, traditional canvassing is basically like dropping off leaflets. You knock on a door, you deliver the pitch, you hope it works. Regardless of whether it does, you move on to the next door. And deep canvassing recognized that particularly for these difficult, complicated issues, you've got to have more of a conversation. But if you start that conversation on the issue, which they may disagree with, then they're going to not listen to you. And so instead, it's about figuring out a way to help them understand why this issue is relevant to, to them. In, in one example, they knock on a gentleman's door who's not really for LGBT rights, but they don't start by saying, would you support this cause? Instead, they say, tell us how you feel about someone in your life that you love and care about. Who is someone you care about and why are they important to you? They don't start with the issue. They start with a point. It's easy for everybody to say, well, here's someone that I love and care about. And then they use that conversation to bend around to the point of, well, wouldn't you feel badly if you know you weren't allowed to care about that person or the law made it difficult for you to be able to support that person if they got ill in the way that is, is needed. And so rather than starting abstractly about LGBT rights with someone who agrees with is gonna say yes and someone who disagrees with is gonna say no, instead they made it about, well, people you care about, who is this person that you care about and use that to help them see that, wow, other people have these individuals and they're being prevented from being having the rights that, that they deserve. And so not starting with a point of disagreement, starting with a point of agreement, switching that field to find that point of agreement, and then using that to help people see that something that seemed different from where they are in one way may be, but in another way may be more similar. I was fortunate to interview Tony Hsu, the former head of Zappos, about a month before his untimely passing. What a wonderful interview and human being he was. But Zappos has this strategy of free shipping and free returns, which was revolutionary at the time. How, for them, did that help them to reduce inertia and lower uncertainty for their consumers? Yeah, so we're switching principles a little bit to this idea of uncertainty. And the key barrier there is, as we've talked a little bit about already, that any change often involves switching costs. 
right? So if you think about buying a new phone, for example, sure, you have to pay for that new phone. Maybe you've got an Apple phone, you're switching to a Google phone or a Google phone switching to an Apple phone. Not only do you have to pay for that new phone, but it also takes time and you have to learn about it. You have to port all your material over. It requires a bit of work. Same thing going from a regular gas car to an electric car. Same thing changing software systems at the office. Any of these things require a bit of switching costs. And not surprisingly, then people say, well, I'd prefer to skip the cost. As we talked about before, right? Old things feel safe. New things feel a little bit risky. And so I can stick with the old thing without paying these costs. I just won't change. Let me tell you, it gets worse. Because when you think about the costs of change and the benefits of change, which happens first? Well, usually it's the cost of change, right? You pay the money now, you do the work now, and only later do you get to find out if the phone is better. You pay the money for the new car and maybe install the system in your house for electric cars, and only then do you get the benefit. And so costs are now, benefits are later, but also costs are certain and benefits are uncertain. And so this is what people call the cost-benefit timing gap, right? Costs are now, benefits are later, costs are certain, benefits are uncertain. You're asking people to take definite costs now for some uncertain benefit later. And so most of the time people say, no, no thanks. And so you have to figure out a way to lower the barrier to trial, right? To figure out a way to make it easier for them to experience the value of what you're offering. Free shipping is a great example of this. It's hard to remember today where we do everything online. We buy cars online and clothes online. We find spouses online. Some people listening to this episode may have even bought something online while we've been, while we've been chatting. But when Zappos and other companies started in the early 2000s, online wasn't happening, right? People weren't used to buying things on, online. And so there was a lot of reticence to order something because you didn't know who you were paying, whether you'd like the thing or not. Um, and so Zappos are trying to figure out how to solve this problem. Today, they're over a billion dollar business, but they weren't then. And they were trying to figure out how to get users in. And they were thinking about dropping the price of their products or advertising, but they realized it wouldn't solve the fundamental issue, which is people were uncertain, right? Sure, Zappos said, you're going to love these shoes, but do I want to pay money only to get them and figure out I'm not going to like them? And so they realized the way to solve that was free shipping and free returns, right? Reducing the cost that it required to get something. And you could say, well, isn't that the same as giving them a discount? But it's different, right? A discount, you'd still have to pay for the shipping only then to figure out whether you like it. Whereas what lowering the barrier to trial, such as free shipping or think about ideas like freemium or free trials, is they make it easier for people to experience the value of the offering. Rather than having to pay for shipping only then to figure out whether you like it, how can you lower the barrier to trial? How can you enable people to experience something without having to pay all those upfront costs? Think about free sampling at the grocery store. Think about renting rather than buying. Think about what car dealerships do with test drives, right? Test drives don't solve all the problems, but they give you a sense of whether you're going to like that car or not without having to pay all the upfront costs. And so the more we can lower the barrier to trial, the more we can make it easier for people to experience the value of what we're offering, we can make them more likely to buy it or take action, right? Because in some sense, the barrier is not just the cost, the barrier is uncertainty. People don't know whether they can trust us or not, but if we say, well, don't trust us, try it yourself, if people see it and they like it, they're much more willing to move forward. So we've talked a lot about the catalyst, and I just have to say, like I often do in this podcast, we just touched the absolute surface of this book, and there's so many great examples in here. One about President Clinton, another one about Acura, another one about PG&E. I highly recommend you pick this up because we really only touched on the surface level. And this is a, such a profound book that can help you in so many ways. Joan, I understand you have another book coming out in March that's called Magic Words, where you reveal how different words can help you increase the impact in every area of your life. Can you give the audience just a teaser for it? Yeah. The quick idea of this book is everything we do, almost, I should say, almost everything we do, but very close to everything involves language. Right? You and I are talking right now involving language. Advertisers and marketers use language to try to convince people. Bosses use language to try to drive action. Teachers teach through language. Leaders lead through language. We all use language to communicate and encourage people to do things, to motivate them, to be more creative. All the things we do happen through language. And we don't often pay attention to the exact words that, that we use. Right? We know that language matters, but we don't know how to use it most effectively. And so in Magic Words, building on all the recent great work that's been done in natural language processing and computational social science and automated text analysis, 
which has basically been most of my research for the last 10 years, um, I showcase how we can use language more effectively, how specific words have great power, whether it's to persuade others, to get people to take action, to make people more creative, to get people to help. All those things are things we can do more effectively through the words we use. And by understanding the science of language, by understanding what we can take away from others' language, we can figure out whether someone is lying, we can figure out how to reduce social problems, all through the insights that language contains. And coming out in March, it's called Magic Words, What to Say to Get Your Way, all about the science of language and how we can use words more effectively. Well, and over the weekend, I was talking to a great author, Daniel Pink, who has viewed this book already and told me it's a masterpiece. So I hope I can bring you back on in March when it comes out, because I'm sure the audience would love to hear us continue our discussion. I'd well, love to do that. We'd be happy to. Well, Jonah, thank you so much for coming on today. It was such an honor, and I truly appreciate it, and I know the audience does as well. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I thoroughly enjoyed that interview with Dr. Jonah Berger, and I wanted to thank Jonah for giving us the honor and opportunity of appearing on the podcast. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Start podcast interview I did with Dr. Cynthia Lee, who is a medical doctor and author whose personal journey through a complex autoimmune condition took her from public health in underserved communities to integrative and functional medicine. And she'll discuss in our interview how she studied with functional medical experts, environmental health scientists, alternative healers, and Qi Young masters. When I hit my dead end, it took me about two years of pretty intense suffering to actually try something new. It wasn't even in my awareness that there was another way. Desperation can really not just open doors, but open your mind <laughs> to try differently. Because after a while, it was like, oh, trying harder, trying harder, trying harder. I'm trying, gosh, I'm trying as hard as I can, and I have no energy. And then at some point, I was like, oh, wait a minute, I'm not trying harder. I gotta try differently. The fee for this show is that you share it with family friends when you find something that interests you or you care about. If you know someone who's dealing with how do you change people's minds, then definitely share today's episode with them. The greatest compliment that you can give this show is to share it with those that you care about. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can live what you listen. And until next time, live life passion struck.